to the cloud. Good morning, Lorenz. How are you, sir? Very good. How are you doing, Pierre? Very good. Thank you for being with uh, Check-In. Check-In is our weekly uh, casual discussion where uh, I am very lucky to have a local uh, hospitality leader. In your case, international local <laughs> hospitality leaders uh, because, Lorenz, uh, you are right now in Hamburg in uh, Germany. And I'm uh, going to talk a bit about you and, uh, and why we have this discussion and, uh, and who you are, if that's okay with you. Super. It's an honor to be here, Pierre. It's an honor as ex-San Franciscan. <laughs> well, it's an honor to have you. <laughs> so <we're both laughs> Let's do it. So, Lawrence, um, you and I, we do share 200 contacts on LinkedIn. Wow. Wow. <laughs> we worked together for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you do speak five languages, English, French, German, Italian, and Spanish. Why do you speak so many languages? Well, one of those reasons is because you are born in Switzerland, between Bern and Neuchâtel, so between the German and the French uh, part of it. Um, you were an apprentice, and that's how you started your career in hospitality with Swiss Railways, where you spent six years in Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, you worked uh, at the travel agency for Swiss Railways in Geneva downtown, as well as the Geneva airport. And then that was in the mid 90s. And when you were with Swiss Railways, you took some extended leaves and you decided to learn Spanish. So for that reason, you lived a couple of months in Madrid, you lived a couple of months in Sevilla, and then you went to South America, uh, and you traveled around South America, your favorite countries being Argentina and Uruguay. So you're already international, Lawrence. And then you ended up working for Lufthansa, where you met your better half. And that brought you to San Francisco Airport, for San Francisco and San Francisco Airport, where you worked for six months there. Following this, that's when you joined the hotel industry. Uh, you moved to the Bay Area in 2002, following 9-11, and you worked, and that thing, I think that's where we met. You were in Palo Alto, and then in San Jose, where you worked for Starwood, now Marriott Starwood. You were at the Westin and Sheraton, where you worked for five years. And then you went on a very long journey with GDV, Joie de Vivre, Chips Conley Companies, where you worked for the Hotel Montgomery, the Hotel Los Gatos, the Aqua Hotel, the Hotel Rex, Hotel Rex, sorry, in San Francisco, Epiphany in Palo Alto, and then the proper hotel, which is not a GDV, by the way, but you opened the proper hotel in uh, San Francisco. And we will talk about that, but you really worked your way through. You went from front office supervisor as your first uh, job to area managing director with a community resort. So you really went a very long way. In early 2018, Lawrence, you went back to Europe. And now if people want to find you, they have to fly to Hamburg. In Germany. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's uh, right. You, when you went to Hamburg, you were the director of hotel operations for 25 hours hotels. And now you are the director of operations for 99 hotels, which is an exciting lifestyle design budget brand. They have three locations, they have three locations in three different cities, and they are opening a fourth one. Munich. Heidelberg, Wuppertal, and they're going to open Amsterdam soon. And I know that you are a very uh, sports uh, aficionado, a sports fan. You are a swimmer. You're a real swimmer. And you, are, you love outdoor and you love football. So you are, you're a good man. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, right. So, Lawrence, I think I introduced you and you have a very interesting profile. That's why I really thought that 
people who are looking at check-in, we love to hear from you. We love to know from your experience because it's really unusual. And I'm glad to have you with us. So my first question to you is, how did you know, how did you make the switch from Swiss Railways, Lufthansa, to the hospitality, to the hotel industry? How did that come along and why did you choose this path? Can you tell us how this worked out? You know, it's, it's uh, I guess, by circumstance, right? But uh, even as a travel agent, uh, I was selling hotels, right? So I was the seller. I, I was selling hotels. Uh, it was pre-internet days. Uh, can you imagine how old I am? We sold a lot of flights. That was before the internet, you know, with a system called Galileo. You know, <laughs> you pushed one button wrong and you, you were done. Uh, that was tedious, but uh, so I sold a lot of hotels, you know, at the end of the 90s. I sold uh, city trips, you know, in combination with train city, with flight city. Uh, you know, the Swiss are not poor, so they were all flying off to New York. New York had the most exciting hotels at the time with a gentleman called Ian Schrager, uh, which yeah. later uh, was renamed Mondrian Hotels and later a part of SPE, which is now, I think, also part of Marriott or Accor, I think. I lost track, but uh, Ian Schrager was, was uh, the thing uh, which was en vogue in the 90s. Uh, as a travel agent, of course, you had to do a lot of recognition trips. You were invited to see all those hotels. And already then I, I, I had the goal to one day work at hotels, but I was in a, we called it the golden uh, jail of being a, an agent for Swiss Federal Railways, which is very well paid. I was a state employee. That's why I could take so many leaves of absence because they couldn't fire anybody. They had too many employees. That's why I took advantage in my twenties. I went to Spain, studied Spanish uh, several times. I went to trips. Unpaid, of course, but but still employed. So I took full advantage of that situation there, and uh, I really uh, uh, already then with the, with those extended travels. Of course, as a travel agent, you have a lot of uh, reduced flight tickets, you know, free train travel. So really traveling. I was traveling the world back and forth in my twenties, and that's when that wish came along to really be. Uh, uh, also part of hotels, you know, not just live as a guest in hotels, but make that my career. Uh, I then took uh, the opportunity as one of those uh, employment, I suppose, you know, employment program, right? So Swiss Federal Railways had too many employees. They kind of made it attractive for young people to take chances, you know, to go to uh, foreign places. And what is better than six months summer in San Francisco? <laughs> yeah. Hansa did that at the time because in winter they had one jumbo jet, that's 400 uh, seats. In summer they had two. So there was one to Frankfurt in summer, one to Munich, and all of a sudden they had to check in 800 people. That was pre-dot-com bust, so end of 90s, early 2000s. They couldn't find the people to check in uh, 400 people. That was pre, uh, again, pre-internet, pre-iPhone. You know, you had to single-handedly check every single person in. In the old international terminal, the SFO, we had to line out the door, you know, around the corner to, to the United Terminal because 400 people want to check in at the same time, right? So that's why they were looking for Swiss people, because we speak many languages. They found Swiss Federal Railways and they had an agreement to send every summer, you know, a batch of Swiss uh, guys to help them check in and girls. That's the best time. I met my wife I, uh, out of the six months for 19 years, you know. <laughs> so you could say uh, I liked San Francisco very much and I got stuck uh, at a good place. So and and then, of course, 9-11 happened and it was it was on six months limit time anyways. Uh, I took that opportunity to say, now it's time for hotels. And I actually, even if I was managing a travel agency as my last job in Switzerland, a little team of five people at Geneva Airport, I earned very good money. Uh, I decided, let's restart at the hotel industry. I actually started at the front desk for uh, $12 an hour at the Western in Palo Alto. And then after three months became supervisor. That's one of the beauties of the US. You know, you move up very quickly if you can prove them that you're worth uh, the money. That takes much longer in Europe, for example, right? But that's how I came into the uh, hotel industry. The Western in Palo Alto gave me a chance. I took it and moved up the ranks uh, rather quickly there. So, so Lawrence, you know, you, you traveled and you saw a lot of different cities. Why did you end up being in San Francisco? Did you, did you really like specifically that part of the US? What did attract you to 
<laughs> you know, I, I already knew San Francisco. I was uh, uh, two years before that stage. I, uh, I, I visited San Francisco because I have uh, a cousin of my mother lived there, right? We, it's, it's Uncle Peter, we call him. That's a oh, funny guy, you know. Hello, Uncle Peter. <laughs> yeah, he was 75 years old already then. He's wow. now, after 50 years, he's a Swiss guy. He lived 50 years in San Francisco. Seven years ago, he moved back, you know, because uh, for old, old people, sometimes it's better in Switzerland, right? But anyways, uh, we visited him in San Francisco. And this was actually also, I, I rented a room with him when I first moved there, you know? So I had a little family connection to San Francisco. That was one of the reasons I uh, fell in love in the city when I was the first time there in uh, 97, I believe it was. Uh, uh, it was just a beautiful international city. It, re it reminded me a little bit of a European city, you know? That's, that's, I think that's the reason why I, I stayed so long, right? Because it's not the typical US city. You can get around without a car. I never had a car. In, in Europe, I actually didn't have a car in San Francisco. Uh, when I learned that it takes two hours with public transport, that was pre-BART uh, to the airport. I had to take a bus, BART, and a bus again. It took me two hours with the car. It took me 10 minutes. That's when I learned how to drive in San Francisco. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but it, it, it was automatic cars, no shift. No, no, no. I learned on the stick shift. My wife had a, a Geo Metro. Can you believe? Do you know what a Geo Metro is? No. It's a tiny little car. Like in Europe, you will call them a Fiat Panda. Geo okay. Metro is a three-door hatchback, a red one, right? So when I have my first job at West in Palo Alto, right? I'm, I'm, I'm a six foot five, right? Yeah. I come to work with the Geo Metro of my wife, right? I, the parking lot, employee parking lot, I get out. Everybody starts laughing. And I'm like, what's going on? <laughs> As a European, everybody drives tiny cars, right? And we had that tiny little car, which was the first car of my wife, right? And, uh, oh, until funny. until we uh, we fried the clutch, and then we uh, we we bought an automatic, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so you were able to reach out to the West when when you applied to the West team in Palo Alto. Did you, did you have connection already there? No, um, or you... no, no, no. You know, I just uh, send out resumes. You know, uh, it was. Uh, it was after 9-11, uh, just right after 9-11, you know. So it was not that easy. It was after the dot-com bust. But I got an interview actually at the uh, Old West in Santa Clara, which is now called, it's called, I think it's a Hyatt. You know, the big one in Santa Clara, Hyatt? close to the stadium. That was a West End at that time. Oh, wow, I had yeah. an interview there. And she liked me, but she didn't have a position. And then she referred me over to Palo Alto. So... Uh, I just interviewed with many different hotels, you know, and then Palo Alto, they gave me a chance. These were nice people in HR. I think they had one of those talent plus tests. They did a talent plus test. I'm not sure if you know that this is that uh, assessment test, you know, yeah. there's many different ones. Uh, they did that for every single employee, I think, except housekeeping for every front desk coast. They did a little uh, psychology uh, assessment, you know, yeah. they liked my scores and they gave me a chance there. Yeah. And, uh, uh, for, like for people who don't know the West in Palo Alto and the Sheraton Palo Alto, those are two properties just located in front of the Stanford University. So it's a yes. great location. They have a very nice swimming pool. The owners built a new hotel called the, the Clement Hotel, the Clement, a few years ago. And you came back to Palo Alto later on uh, when, you went, when you were a general manager at the Epiphany Hotel. So you came back to Palo Alto uh, I don't know how many years after you started your, your career, but quite a few years after. Did you find yeah, that yeah. you changed when you came back after, I don't know, we were like 10 years apart from those two properties, 10, 12 years apart? You know, it was funny. I mean, uh, it's one of the reasons why I left uh, uh, Starwood or that franchise of Starwood, right? I mean, uh, Clement Chen, the owner, is a fantastic person, right? This is a very well-run operation with his hotels. But, uh, you know, they have limited number of hotels, right? So as it was already my second career in hotels, I did the first career in travel agency, the second career in hotels, I had no time to wait around. That's one of the reasons I joined JDB, because they had a lot of properties. I wanted to become general manager. But, uh, you know, I think uh, Clement Chen treats his people so right that the general managers never leave, you know? <laughs> <laughs> they stay in average... 13 to 15 years there, right? Almost like a European company. So I couldn't wait. It, I didn't leave because I didn't like it, but because, you know, I had a, 
uh, the second uh, baby at that time and I had to earn my money, right? And I was uh, uh, operations manager at the Sheraton. I was executive housekeeper at the Westin. Uh, that didn't pay my bills, right? So I had to move on. I wanted to move on. And that's why I took the opportunity with JDB. Uh, I was first assistant general manager there. And the, the three months after I started, the GM announced that he's going to leave to open another property. And I got a chance to be interim's GM and then uh, GM after the three months test run, right? I didn't burn down the hotel. So good. You can stay on. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but, you know, so I stayed there, I think it was six years in total, even between Sheridan and West in Palo Alto. And then I came back in, I started in 2012, the pre-opening, right? I was still GM at the Hotel Rex and I did uh, the pre-opening. I started recruiting. I started some construction management, uh, project management. I full-time switched over there in April 2013. So you can say... Six years after I left, right? Yeah. And of course, immediately, immediately started to hire away the best people I still know, right? Yeah. And um, lost some friends with that, right? I would do it differently probably today, you know, because, uh, but, you know, that's how you learn, right? But, you know, that's the beauty of opening a hotel is to really put your team together, right? I think that's really the heart and soul, in my opinion, uh, and a successful hotel starts with, with good employees, right? And that's, of course, was an advantage for me in Palo Alto. I knew the market. I didn't only know uh, the Sheraton and uh, the West End. I knew all the other hotels as well, of course, right? Wow. So I, I, I knew the pool of employees available and tried to hire the best ones uh, from the local market, right? For, for people who do not know JDV or Joie de Vivre, could you tell us a bit more about this hotel chain and what it was at the time? Because that hotel chain has changed over years. Could you tell us what was so special about JDV before? Yeah, I mean, besides what? the fact that there's probably only three persons between Isabel, you and me who can pronounce Rudder Reef correctly, right? And I think Chip learned it as well. <laughs> uh, it was really uh, amazing. So it, 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 JDV had a logo that was the heart, right? The, the, the shape of the heart, the heart of, of JDB was uh, three parts. It started with the employees. It was always the center. Uh, happy employees create happy guests. Happy guests create happy returns, happy profits. Exactly. Somewhere you see the heart. You're sitting right in front of it. But... Yeah, <laughs> oh, we got oh, there, there. Right yes, <laughs> there. There's the heart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, Chip really uh, believed in that. Uh, you know, you had to treat not only your employees like your guests, you had to also treat your vendors the same way, you know, uh, your, your neighbors. Uh, I believe hospitality is all about relationships and not just with your superiors, obviously, but of course with your employees. You know, in a hotel, it starts with your housekeeper. Uh, with your room attendant, which is, uh, you know, the heart of the room's operation. It starts with your dishwasher, which is the heart of your food and beverage operation. Uh, this is really something uh, Joie de Reef understood. Uh, by the way, not only Joie de Reef, I had the luck. Also, Clement Chen with Weston and Sheraton understood that part really, really well. Uh, so that's why he, he's so successful. What JDB did in addition to that, they had that design and lifestyle flair. You know, very early on, Chip recognized that people want to experience something. Now everybody talks about experiences, and, and but Chip knew that already when he launched his first property. You know, in the, in the, I think it was the late '90s or, or mid '90s, uh, before my time. But he uh, he gave every hotel uh, a theme, a special design. Uh, the Rex, for example, uh, which is uh, now called the emblem, but uh, the Rex uh, theme was uh, the literary hotel, right? Because it was uh, across a famous bookstore. It was in that Beatport uh, neighborhood full of galleries. Uh, that this, this gave the hotel, which is in Union Square, where there's maybe 70 other hotels, a clear identity. Chip uh, chose at the time a magazine for every property, which uh, represented the magazine. You know, at the Montgomery, for example, we had Wallpaper Magazine, which is a design magazine. Uh, at the Rex, I believe it was the New Yorker, uh, because of the literary theme. Uh, what was at the Phoenix Hotel? 
the Phoenix Hotel was very, very popular. Yes, yeah, there was probably a rock and roll hotel, maybe Rolling Stone, I don't yeah. remember. Yeah. In addition to the magazine, you know, he chose five words, uh, which, uh, which uh, people could identify the hotel with. So that helped all the employees to understand the hotel, what it means, what it represents, but not only it helped the employees, but of course the guests as well, right? So it was both employee facing and guest facing. It gave a clear identity. You know, the Phoenix is a great example for it. You know, the Phoenix is really uh, motels from the, the 50s or the 60s. Uh, everybody who complains about an old HVIC system should go look what the Phoenix has. Regardless, the Phoenix was always in the top three of, of, of customer service scores. You know, so that really robbed all the other GMs of any excuse of having anything old or not working. We just told them, go look at the Phoenix, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the people who made the scores there so good were the employees, you know, starting from uh, from the GMs they had. Diane Veach, for example, I think she's still the GM there. Mm -hmm. She was just a perfect fit for that hotel, you know. Uh, you know, expressive, a character, personality, you know, uh, and so were all the employees, you know, long hair, tattoos, uh, character, way right before it was fashionable, you know, just because they fitted the tenderloin, they were straightforward, and you know what, guests appreciate straightforwardness. They recognize, you know, they recognize BS. People are not stupid anymore, right? I mean, it's, uh, and that's the beauty about boutique hotels, because you could tailor solutions, you know, so that so, was really, I think, the, the key success. And of course, you know, one last point is the, you know, Chip himself, you know, it starts at the head, right? Yeah. Chip knew uh, so many employees by name, you know, he would shake everybody's hand. The first thing Chip wanted to see were the housekeepers. They loved him, they loved him, you know? And that's how he gained the respect, just by knowing the housekeepers and not just knowing their names, but know their kids' names, you know? Their dogs' names, their soccer team, you know? It's pretty hard to, you know, I made myself a goal to know who's Barcelona fan and who's Real Madrid fan of, of our Latino employees, for example, you know. I was always the opposite of whoever had the majority just to make fun of them, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so if everybody was, yeah, go ahead. Lawrence, did, do you think, was JDB the first hotel group to really be the, the truly boutique hotel creators? You know, there is always a debate here in San Francisco uh, between, you know, I think, it, I think it started more or less at the same time between Kimpton Hotel and JDV. What's, what's your take on, on who? Look, as, uh, as an ex JDV employee, of course, I have to say JDV, right? <laughs> no question about it. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, it's, it's a good example of how competition uh, uh, kind of. Uh, invigorates the market, right? So they were both driving each other on. I think Kimpton was, of course, very good in what they did as well, right? So they were very similar companies, right? Uh, led by inspirational leaders. So I think these two uh, egged each other on to be more successful, you know, to try even harder. And it's just, uh, I think it's typical that those two companies both came from San Francisco, right? Because they wouldn't have worked in Dallas, Texas, maybe, you know, or in, in uh, Boise, Idaho. Yeah, they, they, uh, these, these are both two very typical San Francisco companies where you allow people to be their best selves, you know, uh, compared to putting them in a, in, a, in a straight jacket like some of the big brands, right, which in the meantime changed, of course, as well. But I remember, if I can tell that little anecdote at the Sheraton, in the early 2000s, uh, they uh, launched a very short-lived exercise called the Sheraton Service Promise. So the Sheraton service promise came with all the, the marketing hula hoop, uh, which for sure, uh, lots of marketing, uh, you know, uh, people with MBAs and from the best schools, they figured out, okay, we have a service promise. And this was basically a catalog with, uh, with compensation for complaints. So there was, for example, hair dryer, uh, 250 points or $25, hair dryer not working, right? Or heater not working, 1,000 points, uh, AC not working and so on, but it was a fixed schedule of what you get if something doesn't work. Now, if a hairdryer doesn't work for me, nothing happens, right? If the hairdryer doesn't work for my wife, it's all hell breaks loose, right? <laughs> so uh, this just shows that this, of course, didn't work at all, right? Because every guest is different. You cannot apply, uh, sh uh, you know, uh, standard X 
uh, it's every, for everybody, it's different, right? You have to have empowered people at the front desk who recognize, okay, the hair dryer is not working. That's terrible. I have to fix that. Uh, and with the service promise, that of course didn't work because if you tell uh, my wife you get 250 points, that doesn't help her. You know, <laughs> she needs to get her hair dry. You know, she needs a hair dryer. Finish. You know, you have to show empathy. You have to run and, and find it somewhere. And there's always a solution. You know, even if it's calling the neighborhood neighboring hotel. You know, I mean, we've all we've. That's why you have to have good relationships with your neighboring hotels, right? Because uh, even here in Germany, we do that, right? In, I'm currently actually sitting in Heidelberg in one of our properties. And um, we have a hotel next door, which we helped out if they're short on linen and vice versa. So, you you know, hospitality is a small industry. You help each other out. So, to, talking about that, you know, I was really checking with Isabel and with Michael Pace, and I just did that with Mark Beaver. And they were all telling me that the environment of San Francisco, as far as a hotelier, is kind of unique because people really help each other in San Francisco. They share information. They're not afraid of talking to each other and helping each other. Is, do you see the same thing in uh, in Hamburg in Germany? Yeah. Uh, you know, I think in general, I think there's a. Uh, a fraternity and hospitality, right? I see that to some degree here in Germany as well. Uh, but I think in general, in Germany, it depends a little bit where you are as well, right? So I would say Hamburg, for example, is more a little bit New York City, you know, a little bit cooler, a little bit more cutting edge, a little bit more, you know, elbows out. Now I'm in Heidelberg, that's in the south of Germany. You know, the weather is, is, uh, is better, first of all, already. You know, it's not always raining like in Hamburg. It's <laughs> one of the reasons they're oftentimes in a bad mood, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a beautiful city, by the way. Really, really terrific. And it's just stereotypes, you know, but I think in San Francisco, it's just, uh, it is special, I think. Yeah, it is special. Uh, it is special because it's a small city, right? There's yeah. no way you can, uh, you just know each other, right? You always run into each other. Uh, it's it's uh, competitive. So, uh, but, you know, competition is good for business. I'm always saying that, right? I mean, I've really had good relationships with everybody, uh, even if it's the direct competitor as well, right? So there is, a, uh, of course, there's the expat uh, uh, part coming into that, right? We Europeans stick together. So that was even a more special bond, you know, with Roger over at the W and Isabel and, and, uh, and all the other ones, you know them all too. Mm -hmm. But uh, San Francisco is just a small, a small city. Yeah? I think that makes it easier too compared to New York, I can imagine. So, so right now you're director of operations for 99 hotels. And I went on the website. It, can you tell us about this brand, what they're trying to do? Because they have a lot of character. We can see the wallpaper just behind you, which gives a very clear identity. You were talking about identity with GDV. But to me, it really, in a in matter of seconds, you kind of know where you're going, going through the website. Can you tell us about 99 hotels? and what they try to do on the German market and how they position themselves? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I think you could compare uh, 99 hotels with just trying to find something a little bit different. I mean, when we created the brand, we saw actually uh, the picture, the, the aerial picture of Central Park in New York uh, uh, in summer, where you see that green rectangle of Central Park in the jungle of New York City, right? So we want to be that green lung in the city so that people really can relax, feel comfortable around all the craziness of a city, right? So that's why we choose the jungle team. We have a lot, a lot of green plants. We have a lot of natural materials. We have stone, we have wood, uh, we have uh, uh, leathers. Uh, so just to make sure uh, people feel good, you know? And that's something uh, in a very different market segment, I think uh, One Hotels uh, does that similarly in, in a high-priced area. Now, Germany and Germans are very frugal people, you know, and that's one of the key differences between the U.S. and Germany, for example. There's other European countries which are similar in Germany where, you know, in, in, in the U.S., people were bragging about, hey, I stayed at the proper, I paid $400, $500 a night, wow. You're someone, you know, and here in Germany, you're doing, hey, I stayed at the 99. I paid 70 bucks for it. What a fantastic deal. And he's the hero. The loser is the one who pays $300 at a Marriott. You know? 
So being stingy is cool here. You know, there's a German expression. It's called Geiz ist geil. That means uh, stingy is cool. You know, so uh, that's why in Germany, budget hotels is not an insult. That's actually a compliment, right? So it's, uh, of course, there is a, a economic uh, uh, variable to that too, because of course, labor is much more expensive here, right? So in order to generate uh, similar profit levels like uh, US hotels too, we have to watch labor very much. So it's, it's much more efficient here in a sense of, you know, uh, I have one bartender, he serves the bar, he serves food, he does the dishes, uh, and then uh, he can clean rooms as well, you know, as, as well as the front desk coast, he can prepare all the dishes and serve all the drinks. So uh, the staff is uh, very uh, flexible, you know, right now after COVID, all the staff cleans rooms as well. So, you know, there is just uh, because uh, wages are much higher, we have to try to get uh, more with less, if that makes sense. Uh, a big how part many, of our night. Sorry, how many rooms do you have? How many rooms is this? Roughly? So it, it's it's scalable. You know, the first uh, we have uh, rooms from 99 rooms. You know, in one hotel in Wuppertal. To uh, we have one other construction in Wolfsburg, where the whole where all the Volkswagens come from. That had 260 rooms. Uh, we have one in uh, in the planning in, in Hamburg, which has 320 rooms. So uh, it's very easily scalable. So yeah. there is no uh, clear vision like JDB who says we don't want to do more than 150, 200. We can scale here because the F&B operation is, is, is very efficient here. We do uh, pokeballs, you know, which were super simple to do, which are super healthy, which are super refreshing. One of yeah. the key, key parts of 99 hotels is sustainability. You know, I mean, that's of course in the US, especially in California, big word. Here in Germany, it's ingrained with everybody. You know, they have not one trash can; they have five different trash cans, right? So, sustainability, recycling, is huge. So, uh, we want to be sustainable, and we are sustainable because it makes economic sense. You know, our our uh, our glass by the by the in the bathroom, you know, where you put your toothbrush in. Uh, this is not out of plastic, uh, wrapped in plastic. Our glass there is out of recycled bamboo, you know, which costs us three euros instead of five cents, but which is, it holds seven years. Yes, we have to dishwash it in a dishwasher, but uh, you know, these little stories inspire not only guests, but the employees too. They want to be sustainable here, employees. You know, we had, uh, we have an electric car in every single hotel. You know, we have electric bikes in every single hotel. We have a beehive in every single hotel. We don't have any plastic uh, straws or cups. We don't have any paper cups, you know, we don't have coffee to go here. We want to encourage them to sit down, you know, relax, you know, just because the Americans run around with a Starbucks cup every single second. Why do we have to copy that in Europe? You know, so it's taking a step back, more sustainable. And, and, and that's kind of the, the essence of the brand. Because I mean, in Germany, Germany always has been uh at the forefront of sustainability, right? Since the 80s, I mean, it's like, it's not something new there, right? I mean, I, I remember growing up uh, in France and going to Germany in hotels where uh, I was probably like 12 years old and my parents telling me about sustainable, you know, product. And I was like, what is it? What is eco-friendly? So I think it's really, yeah, yeah. it's part of the culture in Germany. You have, you have, uh, sustainability part of your day-to-day -day life for well for 40 years now something like that it's really ingrained yeah you can go back to politics right the green party is in germany exists for 30 40 years and i heard just the french just discovered the greens over the weekend i heard right so bravo you're only 30 years behind your <laughs> share maybe it takes us more time yeah <laughs> the wine Lauren, is a wine Lauren. yeah exactly exactly they they don't have enough in germany maybe right that's why but it's it's a passion it makes sense you know there is it's really ingrained right and already from the kids age i remember uh before i left to the u.s even the mcdonald's had four different trash cans you know so even at mcdonald's you from uh, since 30 years you as a customer before you throw it in the trash you separate it, you know? Uh, so it, it is really ingrained in every kid. And, and, you know, when you move to Germany, for me, even as, as being in San Francisco for 20 years, I have to learn the trash cans, you know, <laughs> what goes where? Uh, and, and if you don't, uh, your neighbors tell you that you do something wrong and they're not shy about it, you know? <laughs> so they check your trash. 
Pierre. <laughs> <laughs> but but at the end of the day, it, it's just how it is. You know, we're we're experimenting with other things as well here at Ninety Nine. For example, clean uh, clean guest rooms with. Uh, with steam, right? I'm sure in California, we did that too with chip already very early on, you know, cleaning rooms without chemicals. So I would say San Francisco itself is not very different in Germany. San Francisco in many ways is actually even more advanced than Germany. You know, I am thinking about the plastic uh, back uh, ban, which mm -hmm. they just launched here in Germany two, three years ago, which in San Francisco is probably 10 years, right? Where we banned plastic yeah, single yeah. use bags, right? So uh, San Francisco itself could, could hold it up uh, in comparison to Germany, right? So you were talking about the COVID. Could you tell us how the industry has been impacted in Germany, how you've been impacted about it and how is the situation currently and what hotels are doing to welcome guests and if guests are coming back already, I don't, I don't know if there is tourists coming back or conference coming back. Can you tell us the situation in Europe and what you see from where you are? Yeah. Yeah, next question, right? Yeah. <laughs> it has been a run, right? I mean, we've been through many uh, recessions, but this doesn't compare to anything of that, that's for sure, right? I mean, we were all uh, probably belittling it a little bit in the beginning, right? Uh, because we simply have never lived through something like that, right? I mean, uh, I think the Spanish flu was 1918. And like Angela said, uh, Angela Merkel here in Germany, there is this the biggest crisis since uh, World War II here in Germany, for example, right? Uh, this is something which uh, shook the industry, that's for sure. But uh, I think the one thing which uh, made it maybe a little bit easier is that it was not just the hotel business, right? It, it's the whole economy. I mean, we were all we we're all in the same boat still. Yeah, there might be some industries which are uh, you know uh, less less affected. Uh, than the hospitality business, that's for sure. But there's other industries. I'm thinking at my friends at Lufthansa, which are more affected, right? I mean, uh, if, if you see the airports in Europe, it's a sad picture, right? Everything closed still. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, Chip learned uh, that, uh, or Chip teached us that very early on. You always have to make the best of it, right? I see the glass half full. It's a new chance. It's reset. Uh, I was saying to my daughter today, the world has become... Uh, a lot bigger again, you know, uh, probably we, everything was a little bit too crazy, you know, traveling back and forth, uh, relentless. Uh, I think everybody is, is kind of uh, resetting, you know, do we really have to fly everywhere? Is there other options? Mm -hmm. I'm thinking back at last year when I was with 25 hours, we were, uh, uh, whole staff was just, tr we had 12 hotels across Europe. The people were traveling back and forth to visit properties like in a crazy amount of time. You know, sometimes we flew to Paris for one day and back to Hamburg. Why? You know, it's uh, the Parisians were insulted by we left already. You know, <laughs> <laughs> what was more important in Hamburg than stay in Paris for a few days? You know, it's a privilege to be in Paris. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, how is, uh, of course, it's terrible for the business, right? I mean, we are, uh, as I told you uh, before the call, uh, we closed here on March 19th. We reopened on May 29th. So we're open now for one month. Uh, our group, uh, 99 Hotels itself, has three hotels open, uh, uh, two about to open, uh, 15 more under construction, right? But the whole group, we have other brands in the central hotel group, uh, is about 60 hotels. Uh, of those 60, only 30 reopened now. So we have 30 still closed. Uh, we watch the market very closely. Uh, does it, is it worth to open? Is it not? Uh, the management system works a little bit different here. These are all long-term contracts here in Germany. That's 20 to 25 years. So that means your rents are agreed upon a 25-year period. You know, so rents are based on projected uh, revenues, which uh, now here in, in that property here in Heidelberg, which is a touristic market, uh, we have the first week now full at 30%. Mm -hmm. and it's in the fourth week after opening. The first week we were at 10, the second week we were at 20, and now we're finally 30. It will be a, before COVID a terrible week. Now we're happy about this. You know, that shows you how far, how far we have come. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's, there's plenty of challenges. Of course, we, uh, we have to be even more efficient, right? We, we have 30%, our budget is 80% occupancy. So uh, we try to make more with less, 
you know. So we have the, the front desk host serves breakfast at the same time, you know, before we had a breakfast person. Now we only do that on weekend when we have enough people. The markets which we covered the fastest here in Germany is the tourism market, the leisure market. Yeah, because uh, Germans love to travel. It's easy to travel in Germany, right? There's trains everywhere, very well organized. Uh, great autobahns, right? So th they're the first ones to come back. Uh, so we have good weekend occupancies. The business is a little bit slower to pick up. That's for sure. There's a lot of smaller business who started. There's huge companies in Germany who have a travel ban, right? These are harder. Uh, these are harder to come by, of course. If you issue a travel ban, uh, will take a while until these guests come back. Unfortunately, right? So. Uh, in, in general, you can say leisure locations are doing better. Uh, pure business locations are doing worse. And uh, the, 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 the worst, of course, is nice locations, right? Where you're meeting business completely collapsed, obviously, because of the, the, uh, the restrictions, right? Here in Germany, they're starting to talk, letting people into soccer games again. That will open the floodgates for us. Uh, <laughs> hotel meetings again, right? Because we Germans know how to play soccer, right? Or play Germans, <laughs> The Swiss, we Swiss don't know much about it either, but <laughs> so uh, for us, it's a good sign if, if, if soccer fans are allowed back in. I think they're, they're thinking uh, uh, August, they would let a thousand, two thousand in. So if they let soccer fans in, uh, the excuses not to allow mice or conferences uh, yeah. will run out for the politicians, right? So that's our hope that slowly, slowly it will start again. But these, of course, are the cities affected most, right? The, the meeting cities. Uh, which we have plenty of in Germany as well, right? Because everything is canceled. Right? Oh, yeah. Do, do you have, you know, in the US, we have the CDC, uh, the Center for Disease uh, that, you know, puts up some regulation on how places, hotels should operate and they come with, you know, uh, regulations on, on things that hotels have to do in order to reopen. Is there something similar in Europe where you have one organization you know, showing the uh, yes. way. Yeah, but Germany is a federalistic state too, right? We have 16 states here. So we have 16 regulations, right? Okay. 16 different ones. They're very, uh, uh, like uh, with you guys, right? Where uh, uh, the states have authority, it's the same here, right? So in a smaller uh, country like Germany, it makes it very complicated, right? So, <laughs> and we have uh, uh, the... The, the, the police or the, there's a special uh, force, a civil force called the Ordnungsamt. That it's kind of the, the, the it's not a police force. It's, it's uh, functionaries who con control if everything is in order, you know, they check on you. <laughs> so they love to inspect and check yeah. on you, you know. <laughs> and what so happens it, 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 if it, you don't they close your hotel, they could say, we're going to shut down your hotel. It, it finds, yeah, they find you, you know, so they come incognito, you know, in civil clothing. They go to the, the barber shop, to the flower shop, you know, to hotels. And, and they don't put a mask on because here you're obligated to have a mask indoor. So they, the, 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 the people from the, from the governing body come into your hotel without a mask and they want to see that somebody tells them, hey, sorry, you have to put a mask on, right? And if you don't do that, you get fined and can be pretty heavy fines but that of course is again regulated by the cities you know so there's some cities which are lax and some cities which are very strict and then of course it depends on relationships too right do people so wear masks do you still have, do yes you still so in germany in germany it's very strict indoors you know so in, in all the shops in all the uh, hotels uh, you have to wear a mask in all the public transport you have to wear a mask they're very obedient here you know uh, our fearless leader, Angela Merkel, was very clear. She was straightforward. She said, we have to do sacrifices. We do those. We get out of it faster, you know, and uh, uh, of course, once you're sitting on the table in the restaurant, you can take the mask off, but the yeah. service staff has to wear the masks, right? It gives you a sense of security, uh, but that's also country to country different. Uh, my, my Swiss uh, compatriots does, don't wear any masks and have the same results as in Germany, you know, so it's going down as well. So, you know, the scientists uh, are split on that one too. Uh, he, in France, I think they're less strict with the masks as well. So it really depends on country to country. Right? Here in Germany, they're, they're very obedient. They're talking about relaxing with the masks as well. Now here, you know what, you get used to it. Uh, it's not the end of the world. You always carry your mask with you, right? And um, the, 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 hopefully, hopefully uh, we can prevent a second wave here, right? Yeah. 
So since you work on both sides, you work in Europe, then you work in the US, and now you're back in Europe, could you tell us what you see the differences are between operating a hotel in Europe and operating a hotel in the US? What, what main differences do you see in style or approach of a market? I don't know. I don't know what that's changed. Distribution of the product, marketing, or... or yeah, yeah. You know, there's, there's good and bad sides uh, on both sides, right? I mean, I, I enjoyed it very much in the US. I learned a lot. You know, I think what you can say, I can speak to California, right? And uh, uh, what I appreciated is that can-do attitude, you know? You just, it's trial by error, right? Uh, that's just fantastic. Sometimes you fall flat, sometimes you make mistakes, but there is that enthusiasm, right? And, and if you compare that here in Germany, they're very much data-driven, you know? Another, another set of Excel sheets, you know? <laughs> that's another point. Technology is sometimes lacking, you know, we're probably... <laughs> I'm the only one sitting in my lobby here with a Mac, you know, <laughs> the other ones have older, older models, <laughs> but uh, uh, Excel sheets are very popular here, you know, and, and uh, so I appreciated that in the US, you know, it's that can-do attitude, uh, it's that uh, let's just do it, let's try it, you know, uh, there is uh, a lot of glass half full mentality and, and, and here oftentimes you have uh, a glass half empty and yeah, let's not risk it. We do it like that for years. So uh, I'm hired uh, by both hotels at 25 and at 99 for my American spirit there, right? Because these are brands which are both lifestyle. You know, I need general managers here, uh, US style, you know, I need them dancing on the tables, you know, I need them uh, fraternizing with our guests. I need them to entertain my employees, to motivate the employees. I don't need anybody sitting in a, in a room writing uh, Excel sheets. Uh, that's not for our lifestyle hotels, in my opinion. No, a lifestyle hotelier needs to have connections to his city, to his guests, to his employees. Uh, he needs to be, uh, he needs to want to dance on the tables every night, you know. And uh, uh, that's why my experience in the U.S. has helped me to get those jobs in Germany, right? Because a typical business, my nice hotel in Germany has administrators, right? Which run the numbers. They're fantastic in it. You know, they're efficient. They're, they have no defects. They have, uh, but they might be a, a little bit soulless, you know? And, yeah. and uh, I, that's, that's the beauty in the U.S. You know, you just try, you know, and uh, let's see how it works, you know, and you're, sometimes it doesn't. And uh, that's part of it, right? Got it. You work for small properties, boutique hotel, and you work for larger properties at the Sheraton on the West End. What differences did you see in operating small and larger size properties? Is there, is there a big difference or not so much at the end of the day or how? How would you? There's a difference, of course. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's the uh, economy of scale. That's for sure. I mean, the bigger it is, the more profit you have. So you have in smaller properties, you have to be more efficient. That's for sure. But you have a big chance, you know, where, where you have the chance to have a better relationship with your guests. Uh, this is the big equalizer, I think, we the internet brought. And that's all those review sites, right? So... Uh, you really can develop a relationship with your guests, an intimate relationship with your guests in smaller properties, because you know them uh, much better than uh, if I think about our, our, our colleague at the West in St. Francis, which has a thousand rooms, right? It's very hard to get your know your guests there if you have a thousand guests, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I had an easier time at the Epiphany where I had 86 rooms, right? I really get to know the guests very intimate, you know, and, and you become friends and, and the, they just stay loyal. You know, we had a lot of... Uh, uh, the Epiphany in Palo Alto, which is one of the best hotel markets, very competitive, oh, yeah. uh, very high rates, but we got a lot of guests who uh, appreciated us and, and seeing the same people, right? Because they had a small staff. Chances is you reserve your room with the same person who checks you in uh, and who checks you out the next day, you know? So that is, uh, it's a little bit harder to stay anonymous, you know, that's for sure. So if you want to <laughs> stay anonymous, then it's maybe better uh, we're at the Four Seasons, you know, at the 101. But uh you know, there's a lot of people appreciate that, uh, that experience economy now and uh, get right. those relationships. So this is the big uh, advantage of boutique hotels, really, the relationship. Also with your employees, right? Because as a, as a, as a general manager, you get to know every employee uh, very well. It's a little bit harder if you have, I don't know, money employee John Kimball has at the Westin, right? Uh, 
a thousand, five hundred, six hundred, seven hundred. I have no idea, right? But uh, uh, that's of course it's hard for him to get to know everybody's favorite soccer team, right? Which for me it was always easy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. You know, uh, Lawrence, I like to have when I do those uh, casual discussion. I always have a small time that I divide for students or for people who are thinking to join the hospitality industry. Um, and I, I usually ask the same question, but what do you think qualities are needed in order to, to be happy in our industry, to be successful in our industry? Uh, how would you describe that person joining in our industry? What qualities that person needs to have? I think the most important one is you have to love people, right? You have to uh, appreciate the differences be it employees, be it your guests, be it your shareholders. You have to embrace that. You have to love them. You have to love them for the differences, you know. Uh, I will never forget the first time when I came from Europe and somebody called me because uh, she, uh, he or she slipped in the tub. And then she asked me, what do I have to, what, what, do you, what are you going to do about it? And me, a European, wanted to say, you're stupid, you know. <laughs> Watch out next time, you know. But of course, in the U.S., you can't do that. You have to apologize, right? So, uh, but you have to appreciate uh, them for those differences, right? And I think, uh, so I think that's the first thing. You have to uh, love people, right? And the second thing is uh, uh, you have to have a good personality, right? I mean, the most important criteria for hiring for me is I need to sit across somebody who is interest who is interesting to me, you know, who uh, I have a good gut feeling about it, you know, who can carry a conversation, you know, who is not boring, you know, who, uh, who uh, inspires me, you know, who uh, can teach me something, you know, or even better, you know, uh, you never stop learning in our job, uh, who's not afraid to embrace a job, you know, it's, it's, it's somebody, uh, you know, our job never stops, right? It's it's 24 seven, it's 365 days. It's not a nine to five job. And uh, it's 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 really not, uh, I think Chip said that it's a calling, right? It's, 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 it's not work. We go here to have fun, right? That's why restaurants and bars and we love them. And uh, what's better than in work in one, you know? So <laughs> have a good excuse to be in one, you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I think that's the most important part, especially lifestyle hotels. Right now, it's uh, there, there's a lot of hotels which are not lifestyle, which that might be different. But that's why I chose the lifestyle track because there is really something going on, you know. And it's inspiring uh, interiors, it's inspiring exteriors, it's inspiring uh, people who work there. And, and uh, uh, you have to have that curiosity, you know. And if you love to travel, even better, right? Because you can see the world. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, hospitality is the same be it in Japan, in, in South America, in the US, in Europe. You have to love people, you know, and make them feel at ease, be it employees or guests or your investors, you know, it's the same thing. Is it important for you if someone had did some study in some kind, in some kind of hotel school or re yeah. restaurant school or does... You know, that's a, that's the question I get in Germany a lot, right? Because that's really one of the key differences too, right? The resume, a resume in the US is one page. Here it's probably 30 pages. You know, you get all the entire books. You know, I know what, <laughs> what, what, I know the confession of the mom, what profession the mom had, the hair color of the mom. You know, I mean, uh, the, 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 the report card from kindergarten. Uh, no, it's not important, right? That's the truth is, uh, it's the mix, right? It's the mix which counts. I mean, it's, it's of course, if you have a good, uh, if you have excellent studies, that's not a hindering. But for me in lifestyle, the, the first criteria is personality and character, right? Uh, now that's might not be the case for a Four Seasons or Ritz Carlton or that, that's fine, right? But for me in lifestyle, I need personalities. I have often only one employee working here, you know? And if this guy or this girl has a bad attitude, uh, then that's it, you know, I get a bad review and then be independent, uh, live out of good reviews, right? Good customer reviews. We want everybody to rave about. For that, I need a top motivated employee there. You know, for now, right now, my, uh, my, my, uh, my, my good friend Roland is working the front desk and the bar at the same time. Roland is a fantastic guy. He's, I think he just had his 40th birthday. I hired him actually uh, a year and four weeks ago. And Roland was a professional poker player, professional poker player. 
you know, and uh, had a, <laughs> in Japan. He's a German. He comes from the neighbor. He comes from the neighboring village. He was ten years in Japan, and then uh, 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 his girlfriend got pregnant, and he was thinking, "Oh my God, what do I tell my daughter? What my profession is?" He said, "Now I have to do something uh, which which seems serious, you know." And I met him at a job fair at the local, uh, you know, at the local site here, and uh, he just convinced. He had such a great personality, you know, and. Uh, uh, right now he's my supervisor here, you know, within, uh, within one year as well, you know, and he, uh, he learned everything super quick, you know, skills you can learn, personality you can't, you either have it or you don't. Yeah. And uh, that's, this is a fantastic example, you know, so yes, of course it's, you know, I also have people who did the uh, apprenticeship here or the hotel management school, always good, but they have to have personality as well, for sure. Because Switzerland is, is very famous for the hotel and the restaurants. Yeah, now I, I hope my friends of the EHL don't see that video, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but there's it, always a market. There's yeah, always yeah. a market for both, you know, and it doesn't mean you, they have a lot of personalities there too, right? I mean, of course, you have to have personality and EHL makes fantastic people. And, and it, it's not unimportant, but it's not the... Uh, final qualifier for me right and yeah. uh, not everybody in my company agrees with that you know i have discussion every day uh, with my hr department uh, about this you know what's really important you know and, and sometimes i'm wrong and sometimes it doesn't work out right and, and we have a probationary period here as well and uh, sometimes we, we it doesn't work out right that's for sure so but we certainly have both and we have both here as well you know so they can learn from each other yeah Good. Yeah, you're both profiles. So yeah, like it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We have a good mix, you know. And, and by the way, also a good mix for young and old. You know, we and, and all diversities as well. You know, the better the mix, the better it is. If you only have young people, uh, we have a few uh, in in my age group. You know, and then that's that's really good because they have other life experiences which they can teach the younger ones, right? What was recruiting the same way here in the U.S. when you were here? Did you? It's, it's pretty similar, actually. Yeah, it's pretty similar. You know, it's it's pretty similar. We all have the nice HR portals now, you know, which are developed in the U.S. You know, <laughs> yeah. uh, it's 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 pretty similar. Uh, I mean, I opened a few hotels now in the last uh, few years. You know, that's always the easiest if you can build your team from the ground up. It's super exciting. It's it's put those characters together. Uh, you've never figured it out, you know, every single time you have surprises, you know, they, uh, there might be staff who does fantastic in pre-opening, you know, fantastic on the construction side, and then they have the first guests in front of them and they can't do it anymore. Uh, but uh, on the other, on the other hand, you have surprises sometimes, you know, so, uh, but it's, it's, it's in the lifestyle sector, it's pretty similar, right? You need the same qualities in the U.S., we have the same online tools now. I think we do a little bit less of those Talent Plus uh, 2020 assessments here still. There's more reliance on what you just mentioned uh, on, uh, we call it report cards, right? Every job you live in Europe, in, here in Germany, I'm not sure how it is in France, you get that uh, report card at the end of your work experience. It's called Zeugnis here. I'm not sure if you get that in France, you know, it's a little letter. Yeah. It's, it's a little letter where you write uh, how they worked and et cetera, what the tasks were. It's, it's a really an old custom here in Germany, you know, and everybody who leaves a job gets that three page letter where it basically says what kind of job you did and if you did it well or not, but nobody can write if you didn't do it well anymore, you know, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's not of much use anymore, right? It's not of much use anymore. So, so, uh, but, that, but that's the, the great thing about the U.S. is everybody gets a chance, right? Of course, there is a lot of equality laws which are still not applying in Germany, right? For example, again, on the resume, you have age, you have a picture, you have uh, all these things you can't really do in, in Germany. You know? So a guy like me who comes to Germany who is old, not pretty, you know, uh, it's hard for me to find a job, you know? <laughs> well... So, so these uh, equality laws in the U.S. are something which is great, for example, in the U.S., right? So you can't figure out the age right away. So if you see a, a good resume, you say, oh, give the guy a try, right? And at my last property at Proper, we had a fantastic guy for the manager up in the bar. Uh, he was mid-50s already, you know, and he had a chance to interview and we loved this guy, you know. So uh, not everybody has to be in, in their 20s or 30s and have a lot of tattoos to be a great bar manager, for example, right? Mm -hmm. 
Well, it, w w when I hear you, I mean, the success of an opening or the success of running a hotel or a lifestyle hotel really depends on the people you pick, right? The best advice you will give to anyone is say, pick the right team, pick, pick the right people because that will change, I mean, obviously everything about what you do. I mean, there is as much as you can do, but you depend on your team a lot, right? That's yeah. Yeah, I think in hospitality, that's the key to success, right? Like we said, the Phoenix was a very old product. Uh, the HVAC was from the 50s. And it was too expensive to renovate because, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the lease was only 10 more years. And, and I think they already planned apartments there. So, you know, the team has to make the difference. And if you look at trip advisors, oftentimes these are number ones and number twos are properties who have fantastic teams, you know. Uh, usually they have fantastic leaders. I mean, fantastic leaders can put great teams together. It means frequent feedback. You know, it means also if your team doesn't work to change it, you know, to have the courage. I never forget that one supervisor in Palo Alto I had who really said, that's not for me, you know, and I, I can't be nice to people. I want to be mean to them. And he left to become a cop, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Yes. You yeah. know, at least he had that self-awareness, right? And uh, <laughs> it's not for everybody, right? Because you have to turn both cheeks oftentimes, right? It's your fault that the head dryer doesn't work, you know? And it's not personal. It's just, you know, people had a long day and long travel, and then you have to uh, take it in, in, in good faith. And, um, I think it's the key to success. Of course, you know, a product is important. But I think first, uh, the most important piece of the puzzle is your team, right? Yeah. Is your team. And then a, a fantastic product uh, helps, that's for sure. But uh, if the team is not good enough, and that's, I think, if we go back to the beginning of our discussion with Ian Schrager, I think that's the one mistake he made. You know, he hired uh, models or good looking people and they had no character, no personality, you know, and the, the, the properties looked fantastic, but the service was lousy. Well, let's be honest. <laughs> uh, his combination now with Marriott at the edition might work better, right? Because Marriott, uh, they're, they're great professionals. They know what they do. And uh, uh, that's, I think they have a winning formula there now as well. I have a few personal questions, Lawrence, because we're hitting the sure. hour. You know, you're, you're busy as well. And uh, uh, you know, I could, talk, I could talk for hours, right? <laughs> oh, really? Well, uh, you know me. <laughs> uh, if you would not have been in this industry, the hospitality industry, what do you think you would have done or worked for? What, what industry you would, you would have been in? You know, I, uh, I, I really like uh, beautiful things. You know, I like uh, beautiful interiors. I like architecture, maybe interior designer or architect, you know, or something like that. Now I have the privilege to be in beautiful properties, you know, with, with yeah. fantastic interiors. So I kind of have the best of both worlds, you know. I yeah. also, uh, you know, early on in, in hospitality or, or my dream job was always to be a doorman, you know, because you have so much guest contact, you know. I know this <laughs> is a dying breed, but I was always... Uh, you know, jealous of the doorman at the Sir Francis Drake, for example, or yeah. back in the 90s at the, at, the, at the Paramount Hotel, which was one of Ian Schrager's hotels. You know, it was the, the, the super hip one there near Times Square. This doorman made so much money, you know, and he had the funniest job because he saw everybody, right, going in and out there of that uh, hip, hipster hotel at the time. So uh, that's, that's maybe uh, post-retirement, then I become a doorman, I think. <laughs> if they still exist. <laughs> Could you, could you share with us, uh, I know, I mean, you, know, you have a long career in hospitality, but does something sticks out as far as an event happening in your hotel, something very unusual or great, you know, that made your day or your year? And you I know, know it's hard to tell because you've got so many things that, that you've done, yeah. but is there be two little, two little things I want to mention at the epiphany, first of all, for the team, right? They had a very small team, right? We had a, a guest, we had a lot of guests who uh, had relatives at the Stanford Hospital, right? Uh, terminal uh, illnesses. Uh, one guest uh, had his dad there and stayed for weeks on end, right, to help him uh, recover and so on and so forth. Uh, my two guys at the front desk at the time uh, helped him uh, for his proposal, which he accepted. You know, they helped decorate the room and then gave him advice, you know, late hours at the bar, 
so uh, at the end of the day, you know, uh, she accepted and the two main guys uh, got invited to their wedding in Florida, all expenses paid, you know, and these were two front desk guys, a story they will never forget in their life. They were flown out to Miami. They stayed in the fancy hotel there and they were a guest of honor at the hotel, you know, that just shows. Uh, and we all celebrated that, you know, a uh, fantastic, fantastic experience. And that's the, that's the relationship I want my employees to have with their guests, right? And the second one uh, dates back to proper in another level. I, I, you know, you know, the proper in San Francisco, right? A fantastic design by Kelly Wurstler, right? Uh, just amazing interior design. You know, we got a lot of press, uh, beautiful, beautiful brand, which now has opened some other hotels in Santa Monica and so in LA and Austin. So, uh, uh, you know, we were part of Design Hotels, uh, which is now part of Marriott, right? Design Hotels that was first bought by Starwood and then Starwood got bought by Marriott. So this was uh, a couple of months after opening. I got a call from uh, the GM down at the Marriott Marquis. Actually, not from the GM, from his assistants, from his personal assistant of the GM. And she asked me, yeah, if I would have time today for a tour. And I said, yeah, well, who's coming? And she says, Bill Marriott. And I'm like, okay, we have time. Yes. <laughs> Bill Marriott is allowed to come by and look at our, our, our proper product, right? He was, uh, it, it was, so wow. Bill is already, uh, I, I, I'm not sure how old, how, uh, how old he is, but he's advanced age, right? So Bill Marriott came with, with the, um, I forgot the name of the GM of the Marriott Marquis. He moved on in the meantime, but uh, he was he was sweating blood and tears, of course, right? Because Bill Marriott was taking notes. We had so many crazy things at the proper we did. You know, we had, our mini bar had 70 different products. You know, of course, a lot of booze and, and just cool stuff. You know, we had ESOP amenities, you know, which one bottle of amenities is $50. So the, the best of the best, right? And then Bill Marriott took notes. We had bunk beds as well, you know, at the, at the proper. You know, even if our suite was over $1,000, we had bunk beds as well, right? Because of Twitter next door and so on and so forth. So. But Bill Marriott was, was, wanted to see it, you know, because he read about it. He wanted to see the design and, and he was very respectful, very gracious. Uh, I understood why that company was, is, is so successful, right? Because the leader obviously is a great personality with a lot of character, right? Do you miss uh, the, the food in San Francisco or are you very happy with the food in Germany? <laughs> You know, in Heidelberg, I'm one hour from France, you know, I'm one hour from the Alsace, you know, which I visit frequently, tell Isabel, you know, yeah. <laughs> fantastic food uh, in the Alsace, fantastic wine, uh, you know, San Francisco, I, I do miss it, of course, you know, I miss my friends, I miss the food of San Francisco is one of the best food towns, obviously, yeah, for sure, for sure. If you had a property, uh, did you, which property did you travel to? That was bar known the best experience you ever had throughout your different travels. What was the, the whole, do you have a property where you went to and you were like, wow, now this is it. This is, this is, this is the top. This is, you know, there's, there's a, a different ones. It's hard to um, mention one, right? Um, uh, uh, I could maybe mention it's, it's, it's simple stuff. You know, I remember one trip, this was a hotel in Vienna called Das Trieste. It still exists like the city in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Italy. It's a hotel in Vienna. It is a design hotel as well. This was uh, shortly after they opened 20 years ago. We came with an overnight train, which they still existed back then. And, and eight o'clock in the morning, you want to check in. Of course, that doesn't work. But they offered us the breakfast buffet, you know, very, very generous for Austria or Germany to offer a breakfast buffet, which is 20, 25 euros, you know, and that just impressed me. That hospitality, uh, just to offer you, you're tired after a night train, you know, and, and you understand if the room is not ready and you, you just wanted to leave the bags, right? And they invited yeah. us for breakfast there. And everybody knows what the cost of a breakfast buffet is, you know. I talked in my entire hospitality hospitality career of that one hotel just because they invited me for breakfast you know and that's what i try to teach my employees invite them for a beer invite them for breakfast once in a while you know if if they talk in 20 years still from your property it's fantastic right and uh, that's really uh, one property who's who sticks out for me got it and there's other ones i think about my friend the shetty and andermatt Jean yves blatt is a fantastic little hotel there in a, in a mountain resort but he just won best hotelier in Switzerland, so he has enough accolades already. So <laughs> <laughs> it's a fantastic hotel. If you ever look out for a resort in Switzerland, the Shetty and Andermatt is beautiful. Yeah. 
where, where is it, Lars? In which uh, which location? It, you know, it's that big resort in uh, in the Swiss mountains, uh, which an Egyptian uh, businessman uh, took over and built uh, two hotels and a golf course. And it's it's uh, the village of Andermatt, which is in the Gotthard Pass, you know, which is one of the famous Alpine passes in Europe. They made a devil. They made a deal with the devil, and and and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful resort. You know, Switzerland is very conservative, and and we are we are hoteliers are all big fan of the product because he had a vision, and and I'm not sure if the Swiss would have the same vision, right? But uh, oftentimes it's that in you know the English started the winter sports, and uh, sometimes we need a little bit of help to remind us how beautiful our countries are, right? And then if you come with fresh eyes, they see it differently as 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 us who live there for the whole life, right? Yeah. And, uh, we expats see that. You see how beautiful Ansi is as well, right? When oh, you go yeah. back to your hometown. Oh, yeah. Love Ansi. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Lorenz, we've been talking for an hour and 10 minutes. Thank you very much for your time. Is there anything you want to let people know before we part ways? Is there anything that we did not discuss or that you wanted to, to bring to people who are watching us today? No, I want to just say hi to all my San Franciscan friends. You know, I hope they, uh, I miss them all very much. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I'm not able to visit, right? Or, oh, yes, I have an American passport, so I probably could, but there's no flights anymore, right? So, <laughs> yeah, very few. <laughs> I look forward to visit soon again. I miss, I miss San Francisco, you know. I, I uh, go uh, visit uh, Smoke Signals, uh, which is my friend who has the newspaper store. If you need a French newspaper, Pierre, go to Smoke Signals okay. at, at, on Polk Street. On Polk Street, if oh, I know. There, you know that newspaper stand there? Oh, yeah, yeah, say, yeah. Say hi to... Say hi to Fadi, the owner, okay? okay. Say, say Lorenz says hi to him. I was there once a week buying my uh, European magazines, you know? Oh, good. Uh, go, to Saint, go to Saint Frank across the street and have a great cup of coffee. Saint coffee. Frank is my favorite coffee shop there. I miss that one. I miss mm -hmm. the Rafa Cycle Club in, uh, in uh, Cow Hollow, which is another famous uh, spot. And I miss Esther's Bakery, which is oh. a German bakery. Do you know that one in Los Altos, no, Esther's I, Bakery? No. It's a German bakery, which now I have plenty of German bakeries here, but that was kind of the, the, the spot me and my wife went. If we missed great German uh, food, we went to Esther's Bakery in Los Altos. So okay. go and visit that one. Next time. Maybe. Shout out shout out to them. Very good. You know what happened to me when I go to the South Bay? Look at this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you were at Levi Stadium or what? <laughs> yeah. Not even. <laughs> Very good. Uh, Lawrence, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I appreciate your time. I appreciate your feedback. If anyone has any questions, you can put it in the comments and make sure to answer them. And yes, please. Um, if you want to be put in touch with Lawrence, you know, please let me know. I'd be happy to, to do the introduction. Uh, Lawrence, thank you very much. Merci. Tschüss. Uh, we hope to see you back in San Francisco soon, even for a few days. And we, uh, we go and get a coffee. Uh, we go to the newspaper, we go and get a beer. <laughs> a bientôt, right. eh? yeah, a thanks. Bientôt. thanks so much. Thank you very much. Ciao. 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 Ciao.